A week ago, I made a video breaking down the Alex Caruso trade, and in that video, I talked about how the Thunder are going in an interesting direction with their team building. Instead of focusing on weaknesses and looking for ways to clear them up, adding Caruso was a direct improvement to their biggest strength that being their aggression on defense and how they're constantly making plays on the ball. I also mentioned what I felt to be their biggest weakness as a team last year, which really came to light in the playoffs against the Mavs. In my opinion, it was their lack of size, physicality, and inability to close or extend possessions on the glass that played the biggest role in their demise. So, how do they respond? By signing Isaiah Hartenstein, who not only checks these boxes, but is legitimately one of the best in the league when it comes to doing the dirty work. It all starts with his size. He's officially listed at 7 feet tall. Not one of those fake 7-footers that are all over the league, meaning he's just 1 inch shorter than Chet. However, he's nearly 50 pounds heavier, so we're talking about a completely different physical makeup. He pairs that large frame with surprisingly agile feet and sharp hands, which has turned him into an elite defender in the post. This is really important, as the best post scorer since Shaquille O'Neal just so happens to be competing in the Western Conference. The Thunder caught a break in last year's bracket, not having to go through Denver, but had they matched up with Jokic, they just simply wouldn't have the bodies to throw his way. Chet? Jay will He's too big and physical for those guys, but Hartenstein now gives them some really nice resistance. But that's just one opponent, what about other contenders like Dallas or Minnesota? Well, those offenses tend to run a lot of pick and roll, looking to create going downhill, which is where Hartenstein's abilities as a rim protector make a huge difference. I mentioned the size and agility. He pairs that with constant activity and great positioning in the paint to really alter shots around the basket. Last season, he defended over 400 attempts within 6 feet of the basket and held players to more than 11% below their typical average. That held up in the playoffs as well, holding players to about 10% below average on 79 attempts, a mark that would put him among some of the best rim protectors in the game. I say some, because the best of the best were able to reach another level, one of those being his new teammate Chet Holmgren. In the regular season, he held opponents to a relatively similar 11.4% below average, although he contested about 200 more shots, and in the playoffs, that was up to nearly 15% while contesting nearly 100 attempts. He also happened to lead the playoffs in blocks, averaging 2.5 per game, and all that's to say the Thunder now have two of the best paint defenders in the league. What makes this so intriguing is the prospect of the two potentially sharing the floor. Chet is already one of the best drop defenders in basketball. His size, length, and mobility when paired with perfect positioning have turned him into a massive deterrent and a one-man pick-and-roll defense. The thing is, against Dallas, he was forced to either hedge or blitz most actions as a result of Luka and Kyrie's pressure, then on the back line, they were relying on guys like Shea or even Isaiah Joe to protect the rim. Now imagine if that was Hartenstein roaming the floor, a 7-foot vertical presence who knows when and where to be at all times. That's a game changer. Or imagine if it was the inverse, with Chet playing free safety and cleaning up around the basket. Because, in addition to altering shots, Hartenstein's a very good pick-and-roll defender who can execute all types of different coverages. I keep going back to the size and mobility, those are the keys, but remember, I also said he has sharp hands. He'll reach at ball handlers, take away pocket passes, blow up lobs, meaning he can drop or play at the level, which completely unleashes Chet as a Giannis type of defender behind the play. So right away, you have a synergistic effect between the two bigs, with either one capable of serving as a 4 or 5 on any given play. And then I think it goes without saying that one of the two will always be on the floor, so they're getting 48 minutes of high-quality, starting center caliber basketball, which we just saw play a massive role in the Mavs making a trip to the finals. The one thing that I do think Hartenstein lacks in comparison to some of the league's best defensive centers is that he isn't a great defensive rebounder, which ironically enough is what started this discussion in the first place. 
OKC struggled to close possessions in both the first and second rounds, and fixing that was clearly a point of emphasis for them. What I want to make very clear though, is that just because he's not a great defensive rebounder relative to other centers, doesn't mean he doesn't make a difference here. He's still huge, still great positionally, still constantly looking to put a body on potential offensive rebounders, and will undoubtedly improve them in this regard. All things considered, I really wouldn't be surprised if they come out next year looking like a Minnesota-level defense. Last year, they gave up about 112 points every 100 possessions, good for fourth in the NBA, and their first two offseason moves were to trade for arguably the best defensive guard in the league and a high-level defensive center who shores up probably their biggest weakness. Essentially, they were within arm's reach of having the number two defense and replaced Josh Giddy and Jalen Williams with Alex Caruso and Isaiah Hartenstein. If that doesn't move you, I don't know what will. Oh yeah, and don't forget about the fact that Kaysen Wallace will also be a year older. I don't think anyone really has any concerns with the defense though. It seems pretty unanimous that they're gonna be an elite defensive team, and where people start to question the fit is on offense, particularly with what Hartenstein's addition means for their signature 5 out. Let's be clear, he's not gonna start shooting threes, so get that out of your head right now, but I actually think they can still simulate a 5 out with him on the floor due to two key skills. Think about the Kings for a second. Sabonis isn't a shooter, yet most possessions start with five guys on the perimeter, and that's because he's operating in the middle of the floor as an offensive hub. I'm not saying iHeart is Domas, but he's got the same two standout traits, those being passing and screening ability. He can initiate possessions from up top, whether that's some set off-ball action, dribble handoffs, and he's also a really good connector, which allowed him to make an immense offensive impact in New York. Here's a look at the offensive rating of the 2024 Knicks in three different situations. Here's what it looked like when Brunson was on the floor without iHeart. As one of the best shot creators on the planet, he's gonna produce results. Now here's what it looked like with iHeart, and that's because in addition to the pick and roll and ISO game, he brought that other dimension of movement, extra passing, handoffs, which diversified their attack and made them that much tougher to defend. Just for good measure, here's how they looked without either one on the floor, more as a shout out to the heavy lifting that Jalen was doing. I think he can have a similar impact in OKC, incorporating more movement and versatility to their offense, which I think will positively influence most of the guys on the roster. If you remember in that series against Dallas, shooters were left open to clog the paint, there was very little movement, and it resulted in Shea having to play hero ball and score from the mid-range like prime Michael Jordan just for his team to have a chance. J-Dub struggled to create advantages, Chet's numbers were down, shooters weren't getting as many advantageous touches, and by incorporating some more action with a passing hub in the middle of the floor, the supporting guys can have a lot more involvement. So while the spacing may not look quite the same as the traditional 5 out, I still think there are ways to open up the paint with him on the court, while he also brings a couple other skills that they didn't previously have. First is the offensive rebounding. He averaged 4.9 offensive rebounds every 75 possessions. His knack for reading the ball off the rim, his effort level, his sharp hands, all allow him to generate second chance opportunities at a near league best rate. And that number actually went up to five in the playoffs, corresponding with an increase in minutes and proving that this can translate to higher level basketball. The other thing I want to mention in his arsenal is his use of the floater, which could turn out to be a bigger tool than I think people realize. His push shot is absolute money, probably only second to Jokic, which is such a perfect pairing with Shea's attack. Remember how I mentioned they ran into some trouble when Dallas packed the paint and Shea had to fall back on the mid-range. Imagine if by his side he had another guy who could produce 50-60% to 60 shots from as far out as 10 feet. Whether it's in the pick and roll, flashing out of the dunker spot, his push shot serves as an awesome counter to bigs who overplay either the ball or the rim, and I can't wait to see it used as an outlet for Shea's downhill attack. 
Basically, what I'm getting at with all of this is the fact that Isaiah Hartenstein, to put it simply, is an incredibly high-impact player. During his two years with the Knicks, the team had a plus 7.4 net rating with him on the floor and fell to just a slight positive in the 4,400 minutes without him. I understand why people have concerns with his fit in their 5-out offense and what Chet playing the 4 could mean for his development, but I like how it gives them options. To me, there are 4 starters locked in, those of course being Shea, Caruso, J-Dub, and Chet. That fifth spot can go in three wildly different directions and may be matchup dependent. Against a team like Denver or Minnesota where they need size and rebounding, iHeart feels like the obvious option. Against a team like Dallas where they might need another point of attack defender out there, they could go with Lou Dort, and if their offense isn't producing up to par, they could start a high-level shooter like Isaiah Joe. As for where I stand on the team overall, I'm not sure I could get much higher. Like I said, they nearly had a top two defense, and I think they got considerably better to the point where they might even be number one. They also had the number three offense, and I don't think they got any worse, maybe even a little better with some new dynamics and player development. They won 57 games, had the one seed, and bowed out in a tough second round series in their first playoff run as a unit. I'm not sure if this is a hot take, but if I were making preseason power rankings at this exact moment, OKC would be my number one team out west and number two in the league overall behind just the Celtics, and I absolutely cannot wait to see how they look at the start of the season. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of the Thunder. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.